take, um, I was reminded of this the other day because three years ago, I had a beer dinner at uh, the Maple Leaf Tavern for which I'd recreated a bunch of different historical beers from Toronto. And we had a couple of things that I thought we should include just because they were, you know, good. They were replications of terroir from the province. Uh, McKinnon Brothers, for example, they have their Harvest Ale, which is made with uh, custom Munich malt, or yeah, Munich malt, uh, made by Barnell for them. And it's it's a great beer. If you haven't tried it, it is available at some Toronto LCBOs. I think Edlington and Laird has it. It's just a fantastic Oktoberfest style ale, which doesn't sound like it's a real thing, but you know, they're making a really good beer. So just go with it. The other thing we tried to make was with Great Lakes, and it was sort of a cream ale. And that's something that comes with a lot of baggage. We knew that uh, Tavistock Hop Company, for example, in sort of Western Ontario, they have Canada red vine hops that they've grown. They found them on the property. So these are a hop variety. They're left over from another hop yard that would have been there in the 1860s maybe a little later than that. And they've managed to repurpose these plants that have propagated themselves over time. So what you wanna do is show off what an 1860s hop would kind of be like. And the problem that you have when you're doing that is using modern brewing context. I mean, as home brewers, you're all familiar with BJCP styles. So cream ale, you know, your mental model of that is probably Genesee. And if you're thinking about a steam beer, which would be the other sort of North American hybrid beer style, you're probably thinking about Anchor. And if you're thinking about Anchor, you're thinking about Northern Brewer hops, you're probably gonna use that specific thing. So whatever you make with these hops that they've got from Tavistock, Ontario, which are actually authentic to a period beer, it's not going to taste like the thing you think it's going to taste like. It's going to be weird and different because it grew in a different terroir, uh, because, you know, the style of beer is not really like Anchor Steam. That's a, it's not like it's a complete innovation. Like it's not, they, they haven't invented it wholesale. It's just that, you know, context of a hundred years is going to take it away from where it would have been historically. Uh, we're going through a period here where we've got an incredible amount of new ingredients coming out on a yearly basis. You were just talking about the hop buy and how there's anything new and interesting. Well, there's always something new and interesting because they're coming out of like Huel in Germany and they've got, you know, everything coming out of Yakima, Australia, South Africa, all these different terroirs where you've got really interesting things happening. And you can actually follow the timeline. Like you can tell when acreage was planted Mosaic really only starts getting big in about 2015 or so. That's when the acreage expands on that. Citra is, you know, seven or eight years earlier, you get expanded acreage. So there is like in our modern context, an actual timeline for when ingredients are introduced. And this is something that you don't think about very much, but it happens with every ingredient. Uh, if you're going to create something from the beginning of the 20th century, you have to think about malt varieties. So you just want to make a cream ale, you could use anything you want. You could use pale malt, you could use Pilsner malt as your base. You could flavor it with a little bit of crystal if you're going for the anchor steam thing. Um, but at some point, you know, if you go far enough back, there wasn't really crystal malt. So we ended up just making a Urzatz pale malt beer with Tavistock red vine hops. It was not particularly historically accurate. Um, but it did showcase an ingredient from that particular era. Now, you can actually do historical accuracy, but historical context in this province is difficult, as I mentioned. In about 1929, the Braiding Brewery is owned by uh, E.P. Taylor, and he decides he's gonna create Canada Breweries Limited. And a lot of the breweries that survived prohibition in Canada, which is 1914 to 1927, um, they basically got bought up and he's interested in brewery volume. He's not interested in the beers that they're making. He wants to be able to sell a lot of beer, usually all the same kind of beer. So he ends up buying the Don Brewery and the Dominion Brewery and the Toronto Brewing and Malting Company. And they get repurposed into different things after prohibition. But basically he's 
bought all of these properties. He's destroyed the historical record for them. So you don't have recipes unless the recipe books are somewhere in somebody's attic. We haven't really seen them. You lost every single beer recipe that was made in Ontario after 1931 from these breweries that were purchased. And you're left with like, you know, Molson Canadian starting in 1959 and Carling and it's not really interesting stuff. All the really iconoclastic stuff, you have to go back further than that for. And since you don't have recipes, you have to piece everything together from little pieces of evidence that you painstakingly scrape out of historical record. And it's not much fun at all. I mean, I'm gonna show you really boring stuff for the next 20 minutes because that's what you have to do if you wanna make historical beer in Ontario. So I'm gonna share this screen now. Uh, let me just make sure that this is working. So, I mean, I think we're doing the infinite recursion thing right now where it just says Jordan. Is that right, Eric? Yep, yeah, I see your, uh, your browser. Fantastic. Well, I'm not going to start with that. What I'm going to start with is a beer that we made called uh, Revelator Doppelbach. And it's essentially, the brewery that I found fascinating was Reinhardt Brewing. Reinhardt Brewing was at the corner of like, Dundas and River, basically. There is now a Mercedes-Benz dealership on the Bayview Expressway, and that's where Reinhardt would have been. And the reason it's fascinating is because he's like the first of a new generation of brewers in Toronto. You have people who are mm, hobbyists. Uh, we're going to get to one later who doesn't even really consider himself a brewer. He considers himself a farmer. But Lothar Reinhardt, He's born in Cologne. He goes to brewing school in Munich. He's, he actually apprentices under the monks of Palaner. And he makes a beer called Salvatore, which is putatively, at least, a recreation of the Salvatore beer that they make at the Palaner Brewery in Munich, at the monastery. And, you know, you have to deal with a lot of ridiculous stuff to get to the point where you can even approach making that beer. Now, the first thing that you have to know is that People who have been writing in newspapers have basically been writing the same beer column for 130 years. So every time you write, read something in the Toronto Star where they're talking about like a style of beer, um, they already did that in 1897. So this is from the Toronto Star. It's a word in season, Ray Bach beer, March 31st, 1897. It's a spring seasonal beer and the Toronto star is telling you about it. The following story and explanation is authentic coming as it does from a native of Bavaria, the motherland of lager beer and the home of Bach. During the 12th and 13th centuries in the Alpine district of Bavaria, it was customary to open the lager beer season by a holiday on the 1st of May. My Bach. Uh, the brewers who catered only to the local trade on this day opened their saloon or Schenke where the new stock beer could be sampled by the different parties of townsmen who, according to old custom, went from Schenket to Schenket to ascertain who brewed the best beer. The story tells that on the 1st of May, the evening shades were falling fast as through an Alpine village passed a jovial sampling party, who after visiting many a Schenke uh, where beer had been imbibed freely, were on their way to the last drinking place when they were met by a herd of goats in charge of herdsmen and girls returning from the Alps. Uh, one of the sampling party being somewhat disposed to fool with a large buck of this herd was forced to try conclusions in the course of which his bearded opponent, by a manipulation of the heads and heels particular to the species, brought his tormentor to the ground, much to the chagrin of the amusement uh, of his comrades and onlookers. Basically, they got drunk enough to fight a goat, which is uh, all you need to know about Bach, apparently. That story has not changed a lot. Like, if you look at, you know, the label for Bachfest in Cincinnati, they still have a goat on the label. So it's um, the same story that Cicerones have been telling you for, you know, a hundred years at this point. Even before there were Cicerones, there was this story that people would tell you. The important thing though, is that there is useful detail here. Um, the fame of Bach beer spread throughout the length and breadth of Europe and from there to the United States. Its first appearance in Canada, it is claimed, was when it was introduced by Lothar Reinhardt in 1878, since which time it has attained the highest point of perfection and popularity of any beer brewed in Canada. It might be said that the malt used by Reinhardt and company in coloring the Bach is the same as used in the preparation of Dublin Stout, 
and is procured from Messrs. Hugh Baird and Son of Glasgow. Okay, so the important part of this is not the fact that it's a Bach. We know it's a Bach. It says Salvador Bach on the label. I have an ashtray around here somewhere that says Salvador Bach on it. They kept making it until the 1920s. It's fine. Um, the important thing is that you suddenly have information about ingredients. You know that he's a brewer at Polaner, so he's got the recipe from Polaner. Now, we don't know what that would have looked like in 1878 when he came to Canada, but we do have an idea of what it probably was like from things that like Ron Pattinson has been able to figure out. If you look at the website right now, it will tell you that it has Hercules hops in it, which was not a thing. You're talking probably land race German hops, Hallertau, Tetnang, you know, stuff like that in Germany. So probably Hallertau, which is what we ended up using. And we did actually end up using um, Baird and Sons roasted barley, because that would have been the thing that was giving Guinness its color in the 1890s. And presuming that, you know, people are familiar with Guinness, which they were. I mean, Guinness had been on tap in Toronto since the 1840s. Um, they probably know that there is roasted barley involved. So we used some of that. We were actually able to get it from Baird and Sons. They still make the same ingredient. So that's a pretty good way to guarantee some degree of authenticity, even if you're not quite sure. Uh, in terms of other historical context, you've got a document like this one. Uh, this is from 1901. And it's a great summary of the brewing industry in Toronto. It's got nice images of everything that you could possibly want. Um, I believe it's like page several, seven of several, um, if you go back through that individual article. But this has a lengthy section about the Reinhardt Brewery and how successful they are and how great the kids are and how they all went to brewing school in Chicago. Uh, that's right, the uh, brewers in Toronto were going to Siebel in 1901. Um, it has some useful information about other things that are happening. Passing upstairs, we visited the boardroom, fitted up with all possible conveniences and adjoining at the chemical laboratory, which is provided with the most approved appliances. This is gonna be borne out later by some other historical record. Um, descending again to the brewery proper, we were delighted with the rich fragrance of the hop room, where were stored rows upon rows of Eastern townships, British Columbians, Californians, and Oregons with Bavarians from the German empire. So, you know where he's sourcing his hops from. You have no idea what the varieties are, but I mean, it's gotta be pre-Cascade. You're looking at land race stuff that was probably transplanted. Eastern townships suge suggests maybe red vine. Uh, the German empire, you're looking at Tetnanger, Hallertau, that kind of thing. Um, in the carpenter shops, bottling, wash racking, and shipping rooms, all was bustle and activity, and uh, yada, yada, yada. A special mention may be made of the corking machine, but we're not gonna bother with that. Um, here's something useful. In the racking room, the product passed through an observer which reveals the slightest disturbance. Basically, they've got a sight glass, that's good. Um, and if any such is noted, the flow is immediately stopped and the cause of trouble removed. The daily production is 8,000 gallons. Storage is available for 750,000 gallons. So you've got, if you're writing a book about breweries in Toronto, which I was, a really good sense of the sort of volume that they can create. Uh, ends up being something like 25,000 barrels a year, some of which is a seasonal buck that he's making. Uh, they need 76 horses in order to deliver beer just within Toronto. So really quite a large place. Um, they also talk at great length about opening a brewery in Montreal, but that's neither here nor there. They made malt extract uh, even before prohibition. So this is a, a product that is sought after before there is prohibition. That's a useful thing to know. Just if anybody tells you that that's how they survived during prohibition, they were already geared up for it. Now, the really weird part about this is that in order to address this problem properly, you need actual technical data you need to be able to go back and figure out what you're doing. So you need to go to a microfiche series of monographs from the Canadian Institute for Historical Micro Reproductions. And you need to look up, if it will let me get to the page, um, the Laboratory of the Inland Revenue Department of Ottawa, Canada, 
bulletin number 196, Ale and Lager Beer. This is how I spend my long winter evenings, is by pouring over stuff from 1910. Um, basically, they are going through and sampling 140 different beers sold as ale and lager throughout Canada. This is from July and August 1909. So they've got some lager samples. They've got some ale samples. They've also got people in different districts of Canada doing this. You've got, you know, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all know what provinces exist in Canada, or at least I hope the schools aren't that bad yet. Um, in terms of lager, which is what we need, you get to go to page 17 here. And you have to figure out uh, in the district of Montreal, for example, in 1909, on July 19th, uh, one of the vendors who sells Reinhardt's beer in Montreal, they're exporting it from Toronto to Montreal. There's another useful historical thing if you're putting together a trade network. Um, they have Reinhardt Salvatore. And they've got really interesting data on page, well, the next page over. Um, it is this one, this line here, and it tells you that the alcohol by volume was 5% which seems low. Also, when you consider that all of the other alcoholic volumes listed on these pages are really pretty disparate, the idea that Reinhardt has volume that is exactly four and exactly five by weight and by volume means that that lab that they have at the brewery is top notch. They're really doing a great job with their brewery quality. Um, it gives you some idea of what the specific gravity would have been in straightforward metric approximation. It gives you an idea of the malt used pounds per gallon, um, total solids, you know, residue solids, all this stuff. But that's 1909. And we decided to split the difference. We made an artistic choice, which is probably an odd thing to do given this, you know, idea that you're creating something historic. Uh, we know that Polaner's Salvatore would have been significantly stronger than 5%. We suspect that as you got towards prohibition, uh, the strength of products tends to drop off, especially if you're making lager. If you look across the entire spectrum of lagers being made here, you're looking at stuff that is lower. And we know that um, that's one of the reasons people prized lager, but not Bach necessarily. Bach is meant to be stronger. Uh, if you go back to ale, incidentally, you know, one of the useful things that you find out here is that, you know, your standard strength of ale is higher than your standard strength of lager at the time. And if you're looking specifically like District of Toronto, you have information about the Dominion Breweries of Canada, India Pale Ale. That's kind of neat. Um, it is going to be this one. And it's, it's like 6.4%. So IPA, you know, it's about the strength that it would have been today for the most part. But we decided uh, that we were going to go for uh, splitting the difference. Because if he was using the original Polliner recipe, probably what you end up with is a beer that is closer to 7% with a lot of residual gravity beneath that. Like it is designed for those monks in Polliner. Um, so there's, you know, significant final gravity. And there's also significant original gravity. So you end up making something that is. I think we ended up at like 7% based on information we pulled from Ron Pattinson, who suggested that the sort of 1870s Polaner would have been somewhere around 18 degrees balling. It was like 21 Plato, I think, based on conversion. So you end up with a uh, Bach in the case of Amsterdam's that was, you know, pretty interesting. It was flavored with roasted barley, which is not something you typically get. It was, uh, this is the brew day. There's Ian McCoustra and Cody with his back to the camera. It was this color. It was basically, you know, very dark, probably darker than you would have gotten with Munich malt by itself. We did decoct it. So you end up with this kind of protein skim. It is, you know, a lot of Maillard character, a lot of roast barley character. People seem to like it a lot. Uh, eventually, we did a second version that was more too row heavy. 
and that was not as authentic in terms of uh, production characteristic. We didn't decoct it the second time. We used the Amsterdam brew house down at the uh, Queen's Key location, and we ended up with something that was a little cleaner. Um, the texture you get from decoction is fantastic, but nobody's really doing that anymore. Now, the other beer that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the Hellowell uh, Old Ale. And for the Hellowell Old Ale, I have to show you this document. This is the Hellowell Diaries. It's available, I think, through the Toronto Public Library, and it's it's the single best um, record of brewing in Toronto from any point in Toronto's history. Like, the, the people who are putting stuff out on Instagram now do not have the same level of detail that you're going to get out of this thing. William Hellowell was the brewer in uh, Todd Morden Mill, which for those of you who are in, you know, downtown Toronto, that's at the bottom of Pottery Road, uh, sort of by the Bayview Extension there. And they had a fully working brewery, but the thing you have to know about the Hellowell family is they're pretty well to do. Thomas Hellowell, who's William, William's brother, is one of the executives of the Bank of Upper Canada. And the Hellowell family own all of the land from basically the Bloor Viaduct, well, from the Don River all the way to Donlins Avenue. So they own an enormous section of Toronto, and it's all farmland because the city has not been terribly well developed by that point. So they really are farmers, and that informs things a little bit. It also, I mean, these are kids who grew up on the frontier. Now, you get really useful information out of this because William is just starting his career as a brewer and he's trying to figure out the equipment. So he does exactly what anybody who would make a beer learning their equipment would do. He takes notes and you get some really harrowing stuff. Monday, I began to brew for the first time this season. We got the pump to go by water this evening. So the, the brewery has a water pump. That's really good. It's got a piston. We were watching the motion of the piston rod when, to our surprise, it stopped all at once. And on running out to ascertain the cause, I found a child of Eastwoods coiled around the shaft. Uh, I immediately shook the water off, and Hugh took the child, apparently dead, for it had not the least movement, but fortunately had no bones broken. And in a little time, he was come to his senses. Uh, the doctor was sent for and bled him, because that's what you do when somebody gets caught in an industrial accident. You take blood out of them. That's 1830. There are a million ways to die in the West. Um, so he's learning how all this works, and he takes pretty good notes. Um, in case you were wondering, you, you do still have the same problem with ingredients. And this is something that you are able to put together from historical record as well. Uh, the CBC did a brief interview with us at Muddy York when we were doing the Hallowell Old Ale. Um, this is a drawing uh, from memory by William Hellowell in 1890, uh, basically for the sake of posterity. And this is Pottery Road running up this hill here, past the Dairy Queen. Um, and this is the Hellowell land. This is a cornfield. They've got a barn and stable here. They've got the brewery, the front yard. And he's showing you where their hop ground is. So they have a lot of land for growing barley that's not shown here, because remember, they own everything all the way to Donlins. But they have acre, row, and patches listed for the hop grounds here, which are periodically taken out by giant sheets of ice cascading down the Don River. Now, these are English brewers, and they've come from Yorkshire originally. They're from Todd Morden in Yorkshire. Um, so they're probably bringing the style of beer with them. But, you know, they're also probably using English land race hops. And there's no way of knowing, because they never say, whether it's a Fuggle or a Golding or what it might be, but you can pretty much guarantee that they either brought some rhizomes with them at some point because people do travel back and forth to England. It's not like you're on a frontier with nothing. Um, so you've got the hops accounted for, you've got the malt accounted for. When he says he's malting in, he never talks about malt varieties. It doesn't talk about, you know, whether he's using anything for color. Specialty malt is not a thing in Upper Canada in 1830. We have one batch of malt. You're probably using charcoal in order to malt because coal is expensive. There aren't really colliers in Toronto at the time. If you look through the gazettes of the period, you don't have coal as a fuel very often unless you need it for an engine, which they do sometimes have. And in terms of yeast, 
Well, yeast is exactly the way it works now. Uh, a lot of you have probably been to breweries and gotten pitches of yeast from breweries. Well, October 18th, 1831, Tuesday morning, went out onto the plains to see about some coal. Took me till 12 o'clock and I went to York. Uh, I wanted some yeast for the beer, it did not work well. I went up to John Farr's and got two and a half gallons of yeast. So he basically went across town to get a pitch of yeast from another brewer. Uh, that's exactly what breweries do now if they need like a pitch of Cali or something. I know the Great Lakes used to do that for people. The thing has not changed a great deal, like the, the actual lives of brewers. But, you know, you get more useful, interesting ex information here. Um, I want to find the right one. I think it's November 1st, 1831 here. Yeah. There's one here where he's mentioning beer gravity. Monday I was brewing. I mashed 80 bushels of malt from which I attained 26 barrels of beer gravity 32.6. So he's brewing to 32.6 degrees Plato, basically. Like he's using a saccharometer to do that. And for a long time, it took me, you know, I didn't know what he was using in order to measure that. Um, we do know that he's using Fahrenheit as a measure of temperature because it is November in Toronto and the atmospheric temperature is 34 degrees. Out. So 34 degrees Fahrenheit, I mean, you got some information there that kind of helps. Um, you also have a sense of how big his equipment is because he's at one point measuring the underback from the brewery and it comes out as being 17 barrels or something like that. So, you know, this is measurable. You suddenly got the ability to figure out more or less what the thing would have been like. You think he's using pale malt, basically, that might have a little tinge of smoke to it. It's probably not like professionally malted to the extent that you would want. It's certainly floor malted because that's the only way to do it on the frontier. Um, the hops are English. You've got a sense of how strong the beer would be. 32.6 incidentally translates to something like 1.14 uh, specific gravity. So it's it's heady. The, uh, the thing that is really useful though is that eventually William goes on vacation. So I read this entire document, 575 pages, and at one point he, you know, tries to woo the girl next door through all of this. Incidentally, he's incredibly uh, affected by the girl who lives next door. So he's, he, a lot of the diary is about just trying to get with Betsy from next door. But at one point he has to go away to England to meet the family and, uh, he does something really interesting. He tours breweries in London in just the way that you would if you were going overseas, if you were a brewer now. You might go to the Bermondsey Beer Mile. Well, they didn't have that in 1832. They had, um, you know, Berkeley Perkins. They had the Anchor Brewery. They had stuff like that. So this is 1832. And let me just figure out what month it is. Sorry, be a second. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Thursday morning, took a walk through Leadenhall Market and down to Billings Fishgate Market, which is a roughish place indeed. Stench of fish is intolerable, and the language of the fishwomen is vulgar beyond everything. Uh, vulgar fishwomen. Uh, from there, I went to Whitechapel Market and came back to breakfast. After that, I crossed London Bridge to Southwark. Uh, he's gone down Tooley Street to Dring and Phages Saccharometer Makers to see if there was any improvement in them. So you know it's 1832. We know he's using a drain and phage saccharometer. We know he's using the top of the line model because they showed him the last improvement, which is the same as the one we have at home. So suddenly, if you're doing historical research, you end up with this thing. This is the slide rule from a drain and phage saccharometer and has measurements for density and specific gravity and all of the stuff that you need in order to create a historical beer. And, you know, that's a really neat thing to have. It's a, a good trick. But the, maybe the best part of this is that he's going to Calvert & Co's company brewery. They show him around. Uh, I told him that I was a stranger from America and didn't know anybody. And 
he the brewer says, oh, all right, we'll come in and we'll show you around. So it's it's very similar to the way it would be now. Um, he's got great descriptions of all of the equipment that they had at the brewery. He's got all sorts of this really useful stuff. Um, and at one point, he actually ends up going to the Barclay Perkins Brewery. Let me see if I can find that. Saturday morning, I went to Park Street in the borough to see Barclay Perkins and Porter Brewery. It was with difficulty I could get through the street uh, adjacent to the brewery. Uh, so crowded was it with Dre's belonging to the firm. Um, I told him I was a farmer from America in order to get in, I think it says. Uh, they had a brewery fire that had just happened that destroyed 100,000 pounds worth of property. The fire was extinguished by 200 butts of porter. If I had amazed in viewing the other breweries, how much more was I astonished at this? There was some two or 300 workmen employed in repairing the damage and was pulling the coppers to pieces. And I saw only the bottom, which I should judge to be at least 20 feet in diameter. The room where the round stands is I think 60 or 70 yards square and full of them 800 in number. So not only do you have a brewer who's keeping pretty good records of his own stuff, but he's actually now a historical source for some of Martin Cornell's writing in the UK. Um, Martin eventually got to my book and then discovered that he had this tool to work with, which is kind of cool. So what you end up with eventually then is a muddy York beer that we basically used these guys for. This is uh, William Hellowell on the right here. Um, this is Jeff, who has a similar beard. Uh, the beer was actually thick enough in terms of mash that we broke a paddle while we were trying to mash in for it. We lost the first runnings of the first version of this beer. Um, at least some of them. So it wasn't as strong as it was meant to be. We've actually increased the strength for the second version that we made in December. And the great thing about it is it's like 11 point um, something. I think he had said that the mash in was 24.6 degrees Plato, uh, at least for the second version of it. So it, it's been really cool. Uh, the only problem we had was that um, we did age it in a Sauterne barrel, and they wouldn't have had a Sauterne barrel in Toronto in 1832. So this time around, we've gone with a port barrel because you need that oak character. Everything would have been in wood at the time. So you end up with a little bit of port character, which is probably not historically authentic, but what can you do? I'm not saying that the entire thing is an invention wholesale. There are elements that you get to pick from historical record, and there are certainly signposts left for you along the way if you have you know, conscientious brewers, but for the most part, the historicity of the thing is a little bit difficult to establish. You don't have an example of anything from that era that you can actually taste. So the best you can do is try to keep it as authentic as possible using good information and using ingredients that you think would have in, uh, existed at the time, if that makes sense. And that's, that's pretty much all I, I have for you on historical beers, folks. I, uh, I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions uh, about the nature of it and how it is bullshit, uh, please uh, do feel free to ask them. Because there is a little, little bit of like a soup song of bullshit. Uh, I see there's a question in the chat from towards the beginning. Um, it's from Rob and Sandra. They said uh, at the, for the for the end. Uh, so there's a, a company called Reinhardt Foods that does vinegar. They're wondering if it's associated with the old Reinhardt Brewery. I don't really know. Uh, Reinhardt's a fairly popular name. Uh, I know that. Um, there's also a Reinhardt cidery, and I think that's what you're actually uh, looking at, because the cidery is the one that makes vinegar, isn't it? I mean, or maybe it's the vinegar company that makes cider. I, I know that they're related somehow, but I, I don't think that they're related to Lothar. Lothar was extremely German. I, one of the uh, really frustrating things about writing something like that is that there are all these brewery anists out there, and they're nice guys like Malcolm and uh, Gord and, you know, Larry Shirk. I don't know if you ever talked to Larry Shirk but he has like everything. These are guys who just collect stuff as a matter of course. Me, I collect empty bottles, which is a nice way of saying I drink too much. Um, 
but like they had actual pictures of him and they're like the Reinhardt Brewery had its own sheet music for a brewery song and it had a picture of Lothar on the front. And all I really knew about him was that he was German, but it turns out he's a stout looking fellow uh, about my size. Uh, and I think if I grew a beard, I could probably pretend to be Lothar Reinhardt, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, he did, uh, he was so German that he referred, uh, whenever he was making a toast, he would refer to the fatherland. This was before World War One, so that was still okay. <laughs> I see, I see there's a few other questions trickling in. Um, a few from Josh and uh, Joss. There's one about um, the Oktoberfest style beer that you mentioned towards the beginning. I think that was the McKinnon Brothers? Oh, the McKinnon Ale? Brothers Ale is... Like, it's hard to appreciate how much terroir makes a difference. I mean, the McKinnon brothers, they're growing hops that they got from Michigan. I don't know if they're Mackinac or whether they're just some variety of Michigan hop that they transplanted, but they're growing them on their farm in Bath, Ontario. They're also growing their own AC Metcalf barley, which is custom malted for them by Barnell. And it's custom malted as a Munich malt. So every year they make this harvest ale and it's all farm grown malt, farm grown hops, and it's basically an Amerzen kind of a style. Um, it is the best basic ale I've ever had in Ontario. Uh, when we were writing the craft beer guide, what would happen is, you, you know, you'd have a lot of beer to get through. I think there's like 1500 tasting notes in the damn thing. We had to get through 200 breweries worth of beer in like six months. So it's late November and I'm just sitting there idly staring out the window, tasting through beer in a really bored manner. Cause like how many times can you say bread and citrus, you know, Jesus. Um, and Sweeney MacArthur from McKinnon shows up with a growler of this harvest ale and just like, oh, out of, out of nowhere, suddenly there's this like light that comes on and instead of sampling through like three to four ounces of middling, whatever, it's just like, I'm gonna drink this growler of harvest ale. And I did. It was marvelous. You should try it. So, so I guess a reminder to anyone, feel free to use the raise hand function if you want to ask your question verbally. Otherwise, we can keep working through the, the well, text um, questions. What about method? Did we do open fermentation? Any other considerations? Um, well, Joss, the, one of the problems that you end up with is that the breweries who are willing to do a historical recreation here are pretty few and far between. Um, if you read through the Hellowell Diaries, he does actually reference open fermentation in the London Porter Breweries and the London Ale Breweries. So that was very much the style of the time if you were in a larger brewery. He was probably doing that in open butts in Toronto. I mean, you're talking about 26 barrels-ish, so you're up at butt size. Um, we didn't do open fermentation because they don't have open fermentation tanks. Now, if you're going to do a historical recreation beer with the granite, you would do open fermentation. But... You're limited really in terms of what you can do by the equipment people are willing to use for you. I mean, if you were gonna do it as a home brewer, you could absolutely do open fermentation if you had a large enough batch. Sort of that union method, that'd be fine. Uh, Josh says spruce beer, but that's, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, yes, it is a thing and it's terrible. Don't drink spruce beer. Uh, how do we deal with all the weird brewing sugars recommended in the old records? It's a good question. One of the people you really want to talk to about that is John Downing. Um, you know, you, you do periodically end up with like beet sugar. And during the Second World War, uh, John made a beer that was a recreation of a St. Austell Pale Ale a couple of years back. Um, back when I was teaching at the college, I actually got tried. It ended up being like 3% alcohol. And it was mostly like dextrose and beet sugar. And uh, the story was that they had had firkins of this, that they were flying over the channel on the wings of like Spitfires, landing and then deplaning the casks of beer so that people could have beer to drink. It's like a morale boosting thing, as long as you didn't get shot on the runway while you were delivering it, like in a rolled doll story or something. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways that you tweak recipes because up until 1880, they're looking at malt tax rather than specific gravity tax. After 1880 though, the volume just, uh, specific gravity really goes downhill, at least in English brewing. So a lot of those weird adjunct things kind of disappear after that point, uh, just because you don't need the strength of beer. 
a lot of brewing history is about cheating the tax man or trying to collect taxes if you're the government. Um, it's one of the reasons that one of the best sources of information for breweries in Ontario was uh, obituaries. It's death and taxes, basically. Um, what yeast for the old ale? That's a good question, and I don't really have an answer for it. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I will uh, ask Jeff Mannell at Muddy York what he's using for it. I believe it's probably whatever they have to hand that will ferment something that's like a really high gravity beer. Uh, 24 point five degrees Plato is probably getting up there towards 1.1. So yeah, I mean, you're dealing with that. My email is down here, by the way. Uh, feel free to get in touch that way and we'll get that answer for you. Was there evidence of intentional or unintentional sour Brett fermented beers in Ontario? Not really. I mean, you can take as read the idea that the yeast that they're using is going to be on its way to domestic. The fact that you've got people collecting yeast from one brewery or another means that there is a yeast that people like using. Like John Farr, his brewery would have been at Queen and Niagara, so pretty close to Fort York. He would have established his in about 1820, probably. Um, Farr's Mills was actually uh, Western Ontario, so the Western Road it, it was originally named after the Farr Brothers Brewery. Uh, they had a good reputation for making clean-ish beer, I guess. Uh, at least they were the suppliers to the army, which means that, you know, the army's not going to provide bad beer for soldiers. It'll just make them disgruntled. Um, I would say that there's probably unintentional sourness. You might have like a tinge of bread. But for the most part, you don't even really have porter. Like the, the entire um, Britannomyces, like English yeast thing, doesn't really exist in Ontario because most of the breweries come from the Midlands or North. Uh, you know, Joseph Bloor is from Staffordshire. Uh, Enoch Turner is from like near Burton-on-Trent. He's in the potteries there. He would have been a pub landlord. I feel like he would know enough about yeast management from working as a pub landlord near Burton-on-Trent to try and avoid that. The, the wild yeast thing in ale brewing in England is pretty much a porter thing as far as I understand it. I mean, that's an intentional character there because they're souring it in aging vats intentionally. But for the most part, this clean, younger beer is going to be clean. It's not going to have a lot of time for Brett to latch onto it. Do I do any home brewing? Um, I used to. I wrote a book about home brewing called How to Make Your Own Brewskies, the go-to guide for craft brew enthusiasts. I did not choose the title. Uh, the English version is just called How to Make Your Own Beer. And I like that better. It does mean that I'm in the, uh, the English library. That's cool. Um, uh, I, I used to do home brewing. Mostly what I do at this point is come up with ideas and convince breweries to let me use their equipment and then they clean up afterwards. So I don't have to do that. Uh, I've raked out enough mash tons over the course of my life and I feel like I don't have to do that anymore. We've made some really good ones. Uh, we made a beer with Staghorn Sumac for Toronto Beer Week, like 2012. I think I was the first person other than Jolly Pumpkin to use sumac commercially in a beer. Um, that one's around somewhere. I think uh, my favorite one so far conceptually is a Gruet we brewed with Margaret Atwood at Bose. I'd read the Oryx and Crake books and I thought to myself, you know, if you're a home brewer at the end of civilization, what skills do you have that will guarantee your survival? And the answer is I can turn sugar into alcohol, or at least I can wrangle the yeast that will do that. And based on the Orcs and Crake books, we came up with a Gruet that would have had the ingredients that the uh, Mad Adamites had. That was cool. Um, had a spruce-based beverage, and it was unpleasant, says Josh. He is correct. Spruce beer is terrible. Don't drink spruce beer. Um, is there a historical angle or POV about ABV and ale? If ale was for the common folk, do brewers knowingly target a lower ABV so as not to get the workers intoxicated? Like having a lower ABV ale for lunch is better for productivity than a double IPA these days. Might be a book in that topic, I am guessing. Well, the answer is that probably, um, you know, in England, you do end up with small beer. You end up with second runnings. So, you know, porter breweries, um, at least at the beginning of the 19th century, they're talking about Partigal brewing. This is like really early porter stuff before you get to the industrialized anchor brewing size. Um, Barclay Perkins stuff. And, you know, 
ideally what they're doing is doing a first runnings of wort and then they're sort of rinsing the malt for a second runnings. And the lower gravity wort would have been like a, a fermented separately in some cases, just as drinking beer for people on a day-to-day -day basis. Just because you see people brewing something that's 32.6 degrees, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is 1.14 specific gravity. Uh, we don't know whether they're watering that down because there's not a huge amount about cellar management in the diaries. What we do know is that when they talk about drinking beer, they talk about drinking a glass of beer. They don't talk about like going out for a night on the, on the town. It's not really sessioning, at least in the 1830s. And I think that's to do with the availability of grain. Like if you're in Upper Canada and you're breaking up farmland, barley doesn't really cost anything. So you might as well make something as strong as you can. It'll keep better that way too. Uh, have you brewed at the Batch Brew, formerly the Home Brewing Academy, on their really old system? Yes, I have. Yeah, um, I brewed a beer with them in about 2013 or 14 called St. John Mertzen. I really liked the idea, um, Batch, because they've got that old system that was from Hopfen and Mounts, which is um, Prince Leupold of Bavaria's equipment company. It was installed for Denison's, like in 1989. Um, I liked the idea of making a Meritzen style beer on a proper copper kettle. The fermenting vessels there are terrible. I, I remember working on a triple down there once with the Stephen Rich from Cowbell back when he was at the Brewing Academy. And it was, you know, bubbling over the top of the Grundy fermenter the entire time. There was very little control. You know, it's an electric kettle. So if you don't clean it deciduously, this, scorching is bad that becomes an off flavor very quickly if you're making a light beer um whew. yeah i mean it, it's a rough system to work on i know that chloe uh who used to work there she really put a lot of effort into cleaning it andrew bartle who was there before cleaned it as best he could but it had been sitting uh, for about a year by the time he got there and it got better over the time he was there but you know it's a lot of work to keep that place in, in shape um said you didn't graduate from Niagara, how far did you get? I got, um, basically I started writing about beer in order to get into Niagara College. By the time I got into Niagara College, I was national beer columnist for Sun Media. This was before they were all right and crazy. They were just vaguely right wing. As you might've guessed, I don't really lean that way. Um, basically I got to the second semester at Niagara College and John Downing said to me, you like to write about beer. Would you like to write a book? And I said, yes. And it turned out that I could either write a book or stay in the college, but I couldn't really do both at the same time. So I ended up uh, becoming a beer writer professionally instead of a brewer. Easier on the back, um, harder on the liver. Uh, was beer in the 1800s typically a lower ABV drink aimed at sessionable drinking? Uh, really interesting question. The answer is that the ale was not. Uh, you're not really talking about things like mild or bitter. You're talking about pale ale. Basically, I, I think what happens in Ontario is you start out around 10% alcohol and it kind of drops down to seven over the course of a century. You end up with like 7%-ish pale ales by 1900. So that's not a thing. But lager uh, takes on a great deal of popularity in the latter half of the 20th century, sorry, 19th century due to its reputation as being healthful. Like a lot of the loggers, if you look at the uh, excise sheet that we were looking at for 1910, they're down around like three and a half, four percent alcohol. In the 1850s, the German immigrants in New York, they have beer gardens that are reputed to, you know, people sit there and they drink like eight gallons of lager and they're fine. That's probably not like factually accurate, but it's the historical reporting of the time. Um, lager is considered to be like a lower alcohol healthier beverage as is german white wine for some reason despite the fact that it's not really a lot lower in alcohol than sort of sack or claret in what form was the sumac when you added it to the beer and when was it added good question uh we actually used whole uh rooms of uh droops rather of staghorn sumac like we just added it in wholesale i remember uh you know harvesting it the first time i made one of those with paul dickey we actually harvested it from the don valley uh near the brickworks believe it or not and uh the second time was we made it in van cleek hill and i think they went in sort of as aroma if that makes sense there's nothing to isomerize there so whatever you're going to extract from them is probably going to be like 
a little acidity, you might get some citric acid, you might get a little bit of color, but you can put them in the whirlpool or you know, later in the boil because you're not gonna get like bitterness or anything. You, you don't wanna destroy the aroma because it's pretty delicate. So I saw there was a question up in the, the vocal section from Ryan, she, he put his hand up. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll lower your hand, Ryan, and then you can ask your question. Sorry about that, got through the written ones first. <laughs> no, that's okay, I mean, we got all night, right? Uh, I, I actually had a, a, maybe a bit of a conceptual question for you because of your perspective on doing all this historic stuff in Ontario and researching, and obviously we come from our history, but you know, you also mentioned quickly uh, on ingredients, terroir and things like that. You know, we're, we're used to having a lot of definitions of beer styles, uh, you know, being defined by a place, you know, you've got Pilsen, you've got, you know, nowadays West Coast and East Coast IPA, you, you know, um, and, you know, a lot of these things are simply in, inventions of a new time and BG I can never pronounce it properly, but, you know, the categories, things have slighted. Do you, do you foresee, I mean, we're more international now and less defined by place, but, um, you know, are there Ontario styles that might emerge into the future? And do you think they're in, in the process of those things, something that would be maybe more local to us as a, a very distinct style, do you think some of the historic information would feed into that? Or do you think they're kind of disconnected and it's just going to be new inventions and that's that? You know, a couple of guys in Vermont in a, in a barn can define a new world. You know, can we do that here? Goofing well, around. Really, it sort of depends what barn you're talking about, like the alchemist or yeah, that kind of stuff. That's yeah. Well, there's always a first person to do something. Mm. If you think about Ontario and the, not necessarily home brewing, but like the brewing culture that we've had over the last decade or so, a lot of what we've been doing is catching up to the United States mm -hmm. in terms of brewery quality, in terms of like the quality of personnel, in terms of stylistic adventure. I mean, I, I started writing about beer in 2010 and the most interesting beer that year was Smash Bomb from Flying Monkeys. I went to Great Lakes uh, for, I think it was the week of the G10, the Toronto Beer Week happened for the first time, or maybe it was the Ontario Craft Beer Week. And Flying Monkeys debuted a Citra Smash beer at Great Lakes and that won their little festival. Like it was the, the most interesting beer in Ontario. And now there are, I don't know, 700 beers coming out a week. That's mm -hmm. high. That's probably high. There's like 70 beers coming out a week from different breweries, all in different styles, all more interesting than Smash Bomb. Many of them better made than the 2010 version, not to take a shot at Peter and Andrea necessarily. Um, I think that styles, at least in the IPA category with the hops, probably you're not going to see a lot of stylistic development for a while. Because of the techniques people have been using, you end up with more of a spectrum, if anything, of styles than uh, individual categories, like juicy, hazy IPAs, all that stuff beyond New England. Um, that's just more of the same, isn't it? It's just like, you know, you tend to push the envelope with it a little bit, but I don't know if it's new. I think I guess, in terms I guess of that wasn't specific to IPAs. It was more like, uh, you know, we, as we discover or relaunch some of the people who are malting in this province and, and growing hops with their own thing, you know, uh, will some of the stories from the past possibly emerge into something new? I mean, I know it's a big, crazy question. Well, no, it's, it's a good question. The answer is that, you know, there, there are only so many things you can do with the ingredients that you've got. Um, you know, because you, you're not going to create a new variety of malt, really. I mean, it's all gradations in terms of roast and, you know, kilning or whatever. Um, and in terms of hops, I mean, you might get some interesting new flavors out of them by transplanting them to Ontario. We're seeing some of that. I've actually come up with a hop rub protocol for that, believe it or not, um, because I wanted to help the Ontario Hop Growers Association create a little sizzle to go with the steak. Some of the hops that they're actually growing are pretty good. It's just that they have this unfair uh, bias against them due to early uh, occupants of the space. I don't know if you guys ever had 100 mile ale and 100 mile lager from the Duggins Brewing Company. I think it was the Ontario Brewing Company, but it was Duggan. And they were terrible. They were just, oh, we had to get excited about it as the media because, oh, here's a new thing. 
and it's grown in Ontario and the hundred mile diet is really popular, but they were awful. They were really, really bad. Um, nowadays, I mean, there's so much good stuff. I find that the Ontario hops, instead of like citrus, like Yakima, they tend to express as more like a, an herbaceous citrusness. So you might get lemongrass instead of like citra. You might end up with, I don't know, kefir lime leaf instead of lime if you transplant at Howertown. It's, it's a weird little, you're going to get nuance. You're not going to get big, bold things. You're going to get little subtle things is I think the answer to that. Which is good. The subtlety is nice. We got a couple down here. Uh, wondering if there are any mentions of beer in the records slash history of Canadian conflict, like on the Plains of Abraham or War of 1812 that you could share with us, or the regimental records at Fort York or such. Not really. One of the problems is that the first brewery in Ontario, uh, sorry, brief brewery in Toronto is Henderson's Brewery. It's at like the corner of Richmond and Sherburne in 1803. And the Battle of York is in 18, I think 14, 12. Anyway, they blow up Fort York real good and the records are pretty much scrap. So there's not a whole lot to go on there. Uh, it's the largest explosion in North American history right up until Halifax. You could hear it 70 miles away across the lake in Rochester. They killed Zebulon Pike, it's great. Uh, Pike's Peak in Colorado was actually named after him. We don't think he landed that far away. Uh, Smash Bomb is sadly retired. Good. It's not that sad. I mean, they created a bunch of different interesting beers. They've got weird labels and they got interesting stuff they're doing. You can't feel bad about retiring Smash Bomb. Citra Pale Ale in this day and age doesn't stand a chance at all. I was going uh, to er say earlier, you mentioned that you did a. Uh you do the, the collaboration beers, but you also have done several home brews with uh, Toronto Brewing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really under the auspices of the George Brown program. Uh, the Beer 2 course, which I'm actually developing at the moment for online um, instruction, <laughs> is uh, we do a sample brew day at Toronto Brewing. We design a recipe. We get the kids to get a sense of how brewing works. And I, I wanted to go old school with it, but Zach wanted to use a grandfather because it's easier. So we use a grandfather because it's easier. Like I wanted to get the old school, you know, Coleman cooler with the old, you know, last of the steam powered trains stuff. And uh, the grandfather is, you can control it from your phone. It's great. But we've made uh, a George Brown milk stout. We made a, a, uh, George Brown was not only the publisher of the Globe and Mail, but he had a hobby farm in Brentford, Ontario, where he raised prized cattle. So we thought milk stout was appropriate. Um, we made some saisons. We made we used the uh, Yuvaru yeast. I think we were the first people in Ontario to use that for a farmhouse Lithuanian beer that we made for beer school. <laughs> um, one of the great things about that course is that I'm having to put together an off-flavor seminar, uh, decentralized, because it's like this. Everybody is at home. And you have to figure out a way to get people to experience off flavors in beer at home on a budget. So for under $10, I've managed to put together 17 or 18 different off flavors using common ingredients you'd find in your kitchen. Um, and also a penny from between 1982 and 1996 because it's 98% copper. It's a good way to replicate metallic off flavors. Uh, yeah, the, the brewing courses, the beer courses at George Brown are. The first one is stylistically based, has some history stuff in it. Uh, it's very good. That course has really existed for about 18 or 20 years. I think Stephen Beaumont designed it. Ron Keefe from the Granite has taught that one, as is Paul Dickey. So, you know, he's got some pedigree on it. Um, the second one, the Beer 2 course, is more or less where flavors come from in beer. I actually have this book back here. Uh, you can see it on the edge of the couch. It's uh, Nosedive, A Guide to the World Smells by Harold McGee. And I'm finding it really useful for hop varieties and where esters and terpenes come from. Um, I'm really interested in that portion of it. One of the things I do periodically on, on, on the side is just research floral sort of aroma and how it intersects with hops because I hate when people say, oh, it's a little floral. That doesn't mean anything. There's like millions of different kinds of flowers. Can you at least get to geranium? Can you tell me anything? And I'd like to fix that for people. That'd be cool. 
Uh, wasn't George Brown a prohibitionist? Not according to the dinners that he threw at his <laughs> Bow Park estate. You'd be amazed the people who are theoretically prohibitionists throughout history who knew a lot about beer. Uh, John Wesley, for example, who's the head of the Methodist religion and famously a teetotaler eventually, has a long digression in his diary about the uh, quality of different hops from different farms. And I'm pretty sure that he wasn't using them as a soporific. So, you know, there's that. Um, yeah, kind of like the George John Palmer uh, things. Uh, the third course is actually beer and food pairing, which I'm also having to decentralize. And it's just giving me connections because like, how do you get people to experience the same thing in Sarnia and Ottawa at the same time? I'm not sure yet, but I'm going to have an answer for you in two weeks because that's when we film the damn thing. Fortunately, nobody else is crazy enough to even bother trying doing that, so it's fine. Do I have a list of those 12 kitchen ingredients for off-flavor training? A green apple, uh, vinegar, you need Werther's Originals or uh, at least microwave popcorn, preferably the buttery Orville Redenbacher flavor, that's diacetyl. Uh, Virginia red skin peanuts, that's for grainy or husky off astringency because essentially what you're dealing with is cellulose material, uh, seed nut skins, end up giving you that astringent character on your palate. You could also use bran cereal, because if you were using like wheat bran uh, and you were to steep it as though it were a tea, you would pull astringency out of it using boiling water. You could get husky off flavor that way. I've got an egg. Uh, you're supposed to boil it for 20 minutes so that you extract hydrogen uh, sulfide into that gray ring around the yolk. You've had overboiled eggs, presumably. That's a way to do that. And it will allow people to experience rotten egg without actually making them keep an egg under the fridge for three weeks. Uh, Parmesan, because you need butyric and also isovaleric characteristics. Uh, you've got an onion for dimethyl trisulfide uh, and a live skunk. We're going to have to clear that one with the Humane Society. Um, but I mean, you also, you know, tetrahydropyridine, you're going to get that from uh, tortillas uh, if you griddle them. And because we're a culinary school, we have griddles, so that's good. I mean, it'll all make sense on the day. <laughs> What's your take on uh, Ontario Pale Ale and it being an Ontario style to hold up? Well, is, is anybody making them anymore? I mean, I, I noticed that people are still complaining about them, despite the fact that you don't really <laughs> see them much. Uh, I like Tanker. I don't know if you guys have tried Tankos over the last couple of years, but before he passed away, Joel Manning actually went through and tweaked all the recipes so that they would adhere to the organic standards that Mill Street has for their core four brands. I think that they've got, uh, you know, organic lager, 100th Meridian Tankos and Cobblestone. And also they've got an organic Pilsner now, so that works pretty well. But um, Tankos tastes better than it has in years. I, I think that maybe the organic crystal malt that they're using is less fruity somehow it's a little less terrible <laughs> I, I was not. just i was just thinking because victor north has um canadian beer styles that he's like kind of put forth as like a provisional bgcp thing and uh Ooh, i don't know if you've seen those the difficulty is right the brute ipa if you're going to advance that as a style it caught on across the world very quickly because you were able to share it on instagram and people gave a crap does anybody outside of Ontario care about the Ontario Pale Ale? No, I mean, because it has Ontario in the name. <laughs> well, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. And, um, you know, Stephen Beaumont and uh, some of the other judges at an international level, they claim that one of the reasons Ontario is lagging a little bit in terms of international recognition is that none of our competitions will pay to fly in international judges. Like if they do the uh, Sao Paulo Beer Festival or if they do something in Austria or Spain or wherever, uh, Belgium, they will fly international judges in and they'll you know put them up at a hotel and stuff like that. And you get writing about those different markets as a result of that. I've tried Brazil beers as a result of Beaumont having gone to Brazil. Nobody ever comes to Canada despite the fact it is literally one border crossing. We can't get people from Buffalo. What does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, our Hoper competition against people from Buffalo and Pittsburgh, but that's because we go there. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I mean, like, if you're talking about the Canadian Brewing Awards or yeah. the Ontario Brewing Awards, kind of hard. 
What smell do you get if you griddle your skunk? <laughs> well, that's a question for them folk down in Alabama. Um, don't know. I, I did actually request a skunk hand puppet because I thought that was a better. Would you believe that the college was unwilling to reimburse me $25 for a skunk hand puppet? I'm, I'm curious if you said onion for DMS. Well, trimethyl sulfide, which is oh. allium. Dimethyl sulfide, I've got a can of creamed corn for it. Oh, okay. I've I tried almost... to keep it under $10, so I waited until the creamed corn was on sale. $1.79. I was going to suggest I could boil shrimp water. Ugh. I mean, it's it. not a bad solution, but... I mean, essentially, at this point, I'm trying to figure out how I can make all of the ingredients into a terrible omelet at the end. All right, does anyone else have any questions for Jordan? All right, if not, uh, I guess uh, we can wrap up the presentation part. Thanks, Jordan. I think I'll amend your your uh, your, bi your biography to say local beer treasure, because I don't think anyone else would have the patience to go and comb through those historical records like you have. And I'm glad that we have someone in Toronto who's willing to do that. Well, you have to understand that I'm deeply crazy and that probably helps. <laughs> Toronto's beer historian, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks, you, thank you, Jordan. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Hopefully, we can have you back at some point. Uh, always great, great to hear uh, all your perspectives on various things. And uh, I guess a reminder to go and explore the various things that Jordan has his hands in. Uh, they release their podcast weekly. I believe tomorrow's podcast, or Tuesday's podcast, is going to talk about Matt Doomring's latest uh, crazy creation. The slurp beer. If you want to know more about that creation, Robin is tasting it live on the podcast tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Which means yes. that she did it earlier tonight, but I already know what the outcome is, so. <laughs> and uh, also check out his books. Oh, yeah. And we did actually rebrew the Hellowell Old Ale, so there may be bottles of it available uh, at Muddy York at some point in the near future. Uh, it would be an unaged version of it, the way it probably would have been coming out of the Hellowell Brewery. I'd have to check with Jeff to see what the availability is on that, but uh, there is some of it somewhere. Beautiful. All right. Well, th thanks so much. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll call the, I'll, I'll hit the stop button on recording and we can, uh,